Πήγαμε. Σας καλωσορίζουμε στο σημερινό σεμινάριο. Ξεκινάμε τώρα στα αγγλικά, για ακριβώς επειδή καταγράφεται. It is a pleasure to have with us uh, Dr. Georgios Doulis. Uh, he had uh, his degree in physics at uh, the University of Athens. And from the same university got also his master's degree in nuclear physics and his PhD in New Zealand at Apple University in, on uh, applied mathematics. Then he started a series of uh, postdoc positions at the Otago University, at Potsdam, at the Max Planck uh, Institute for Gravitational Physics, then to the University of Warsaw in Poland. And today he is a postdoc uh, in parallel, as far as I understand, at the University of Athens and at the uh, Institute of Theoretical Physics in Vienna, in Germany. Uh, You already see the title of his today's shock, uh, uh, talk, Entropy as Shock Indicator in Neutron Star Merger Simulations. We're very glad to listen to you. So thanks for, for having me here. So I'm, uh, um, I'm really happy I'm able to talk in a live audience after almost two and a half uh, years. Louder, please. Ah, okay, so I'm, I'm really happy that I'm able to talk in front of a live audience again and present my work. So I'm really grateful that uh, you gave me the opportunity to present my work in person here in this beautiful institute. And uh, so today I'm going to talk about another awesome application of the entropy So uh, today I'm going to discuss how entropy can be used as a shock indicator in, um, in fluid dynamics. So, um, so this work was conducted in, um, was initiated in the Institute of Theoretical Physics in Vienna. So it's a collaboration with uh, Sebastiano Bernucci, Florian Attenender and uh, Bernd Bruckmann. So, So the structure of, of my talk is the following. So I'll give a motivation of why we're doing, uh, why we're using entropy as a shock indicator. Then I'll make a brief overview of the method. And then the last three parts will be uh, just, uh, you know, testing our method and then results. So first we'll have some special relativistic uh, tests, then 3D general relativistic tests. And then here we'll have the first binary neutron star simulations that uh, have been made with this entropy uh, method. So I'll start with the motivation. So, uh, so I just want to show what can go wrong when one is considering nonlinear uh, equations. So I, I, um, here I'm, uh, I'm considering the most simple Non-linear scalar equation that we know that's a Burgers equation. So, um, so the nature of this equation is that uh, we start from initial smooth initial data, and then during the evolution, uh, we have the formation of a shock. And um, here in these two frames, I'm going to show on the left frame. So they are exactly the same initial uh, data. It's just because here we have some oscillations, so the framing has been enlarged. So it's exactly the same uh, initial data. So on the left, I'm using a higher order scheme in order to uh, approximate uh, here this uh, spatial derivative. And uh, on the right frame, I'm using a first order scheme in order to make this approximation. And we know what we expect is that the first order, uh, the higher order scheme uh, will develop oscillations This is a, a direct uh, consequence of the Kodanov uh, theorem. And on the right-hand side, we have this first order system uh, scheme. So we know that we won't see any oscillation, but uh, we have inaccurate uh, uh, solution because we'll see that the, the original wave is, is merged out. So it's, you know, it's dispersed. So let's see how that looks. So we see that Here, still everything is uh, smooth. And here we have the shock uh, developing. And we see that the higher order scheme, so we're talking about second, third, fourth order scheme, we start developing oscillations. When the first order scheme 
while the first order scheme here uh, is suppressing these oscillations, but we see that the, 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 the result is not accurate. Can you use, uh, density? What is no, 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 this is just a scalar equation, so it's just Q. Yeah, it's just a function of uh, the time and the and the position. So it's a scalar equation. There are no uh, no no relativity involved. Nothing. Okay, let's. And this is what I just said. That what we saw on the left side is expected from Kordanov's theorem. So that you know these oscillations are always expected when we have second or higher order schemes. Uh, with the first order schemes. Uh, we don't have any oscillations, but we have very low accuracy. So our goal, my goal in this talk is to show how one can develop a higher order scheme without oscillations. So we have the benefits from each one of these uh, schemes. So this non-oscillatory behavior from the low order scheme and the high accuracy from the higher order scheme. So in the literature, uh, there are several ways to do that. Uh, where I'm going to follow the flux limiter approach. And uh, I'll try to develop a flux limiter that is based on a physical quantity, which uh, this physical quantity we chose to be the entropy. And I'll explain why we chose entropy to play this role. Um, so and now I'll give a brief overview of the general relativistic hydrodynamics. So, um, so we know that uh, a relativistic fluid in the presence of a non-trivial gravitational field can be written in this conservative form. And uh, I'm using here the Valencia uh, formulation, which um, uh, has introduced these conserved variables. So we have the time derivative of the conserved variables added to the spatial derivative of the so-called physical fluxes. And the right-hand side is so-called sources. And um, so according to the Valencia formulation, uh, we have five concerned variables. So this SI, this is a three vector. So we have five uh, conserved variables, but these are not the physical variables. So they were introduced in order to write our system of equations in this beautiful, simple conservative form. And uh, so these are related to the physical variables. So we call these um, primitive variables. So this is the one that we can uh, measure. So this is the rest mass density. So W is the, um, is the Lorentz factor, which is given here in terms of the fluid velocity. So that's the three, the three dimensional fluid velocity. That's the enthalpy, which is given in terms of the uh, internal energy. And also we have the pressure. So if we count the amount, uh, the number of the um, uh, unknown variables we have, so we have three velocities, the mass density, we have the uh, internal energy and the pressure. So we have six and uh, we have five equations. So we see that our system is underdetermined. So we have five equations for six unknowns. Uh, so we see how we are going to solve this one. So also, um, these ones here, the physical fluxes are defined in this way. So you see that the lapse function and the shift vector has appeared. So this means that we're working the three plus one decomposition. And um, also the source term, the one that it's here sitting on the right hand side, uh, it depends on the gravitational field. So we have the uh, Christoffel symbol and also the energy momentum tensor here. So when we're doing special relativity, the source term is canceling count because it depends only on the gravitational field. So, and then we have to solve this conservation form, the homogeneous uh, version of the conservation law. So, as I said before, our system is underdetermined. So, uh, we have to introduce another equation. And what we do in astrophysics is that in fluid dynamic is that we have to introduce an equation of state that is describing the matter of the fluid that we are uh, studying. So in the following, we're going to use equations of state where the pressure is given in terms of the mass density and of the internal energy. Okay, so according to the finite volume method, the first thing that we all do when we do numerics is we have first 
to discretize the special derivatives, and then we have a semi-discrete system, and then we have to use a time integration. So the first thing we do here, I'm only going to talk about the spatial, how we approximate the spatial derivative. And uh, we see here that um, we have three dimensions. So this is the X, Y, Z. And uh, I just show here how we do it on the one dimension, on the X, the X derivative, because it has been shown from experience that is just, we can just separately do this discretization the X, Y, Z, and then sum them up, and then we have a whole full three-dimensional system. So uh, the way it's done in the finite volume method is that this derivative of the physical flux is approximated in this way. So these are the so-called numerical fluxes. And you see that we have I and I plus one half indices. So um, because in finite volume, you know, we're discretizing uh, uh, with cells. So uh, the value of the quantity at I, it's in the center of the cell, while uh, this I plus one and plus, play, uh, plus minus one over half is uh, the value on the, on the boundaries of the cell, on the interface, on the cell interfaces. Um, so it won't play a role in the presentation, but just to, to know what it's, uh, uh, what's happening. Now, so the next step, so we have discretized our derivatives. And now the next step is how we're going to approximate these numerical fluxes. So uh, we're going to use the flux limiter approach. So in the flux limiter approach, the idea is that you, we split these numerical fluxes in two parts. So the first part uh, is composed by a so-called higher order numerical flux. And the second part is composed by a lower order numerical flux. So, and what's the idea of a, numeric, uh, of, um, of a flux limiter? So the idea is that, uh, as I showed before, you know, this wave, when it's moving, we have, uh, you know, smooth regions where we don't have any shocks developing. So the idea is that we use in these regions, the higher order scheme. So the higher order scheme is totally, uh, it's working fine when we don't have any uh, non-smooth features appearing. Then when we are at the shock, or something that it's not smooth, we want to switch to the low order scheme. And we show that the low order scheme is stable there. So actually, by doing that, we're actually uh, combining, we're calculating the numerical flux using two fluxes, one for the regions around the shocks and one for the smooth regions. So this is total standard procedure. I haven't done anything. So one can find that in a chapter of a book like Toro. So it's, this is totally standard formulation. So this flux limiter uh, idea, it's not new. This, is, this exists in the bibliography. It's uh, used quite uh, widely. So as I say here, this flux here, it's for the smooth regions. The other one, this one is for the non-smooth regions. And then this theta. So this theta, it's called the so-called, this is the flux limiter function. And this is a weight that tells us how much from each of these numerical fluxes to use. So ideally, when we're in a smooth region, we want to use only this one. So this means that theta has to be equal to one. So the second term is dying out, but then we have only the first term in the smooth regions. And then we have this are fourth, fifth, third uh, order accurate uh, uh, schemes. So we can have high convergence and high accuracy in these regions. That this is what we want. So in the non-smooth regions where we have a shock developing and you know this, the higher order schemes cannot uh, resolve the problem. So they uh, develop these oscillations, then we want theta to be equal to zero. And then we see that the higher order the first term is dying out and we're left only with the lower order term. Uh, in reality, we this theta zero or one, these boundary values, it's very rare to have this, uh, uh, extreme values, we have something in between. So we have 60% from the higher order or 30% from the low order. And this is that gives us higher chances to have higher accuracy. So our convergence rates to be more than second order that in the bibliography we have second order, that's the highest we have achieved in binary neutron star simulations. Um, so now I'm going now to talk a little bit about each part. So for, uh, about theta, about this higher order flux and the lower order flux. So here I just mentioned that the higher order flux is obtained 
with the use of a high order reconstruction operator. This is what I said before. So here we're using this fifth order central uh, operator, which that is not capturing shock, shocks. So if you use that to simulate the region of a shock, you have the oscillations that I showed just before. So we have to be really careful that, you know, this theta function is behaves in a way that we use this only in smooth or semi-smooth regions. So we don't have oscillations. So for up to this point, everything is standard. We haven't done any contribution. We haven't done anything different from what one can find in bibliography. Here we start diverging a little bit from the bibliography. So this lower order flux, usually in bibliography, it's usually a low uh, order, uh, first order scheme, but it's stable. But uh, in the last decade, we have also high order schemes that are stable. Uh, but again, if one could ask, and then why you do all this, why you just don't use these high order schemes in order to do your simulations, they are stable. They don't produce oscillations, but they, for some reasons, uh, through their designs, one cannot achieve higher accuracy with them. Although they are fifth order, where uh, one can use a fifth order stable shock capturing uh, scheme, but cannot achieve fifth order accuracy, but second order. So this is why we are all doing this thing. So we try to get a little bit higher than the second, third, fourth, fifth. And um, so that's the first contribution. So we're generalizing the traditional notion of flux limiting scheme. So, so one could say that's not right. It's not a low order scheme, the one we are using. Yeah, one could, I would say that we, we should write there stable, but this is tradition. And we keep the formulation that it's on the literature so people are not um, understand what's happening. So we have tried a lot of first, second, third, fifth order uh, reconstruction schemes. And uh, from our experience and the experiments we did, we found out that the best behaving was this fifth order weighted essentially non oscillator refined a different scheme that we call Venus from now on. And if you want to see the detail about it, uh, you can find it in the reference. Okay, so, um, and now we talked about the higher order flux, low order flux. Now, our big contribution is how we calculate this flux limiter function, this is theta. Uh, one can find the plethora of flux limiter functions theta in the bibliography, but none of them is motivated from a physical quantity. And uh, this is really interesting because entropy is an ideal candidate to play this role. Because we know that the shock, it's an irreversible um, procedure, process. And when we have an irreversible process, entropy can only increase. So, uh, so if we monitor the entropy of the system, uh, we can, and we see, we know that there is a shock somewhere in the system will develop, and we see that the entropy starts suddenly jumping up, then most probably this is because we have a shock developing there. So it's a really physical way of it's a, it's a, it's a really physical um, way of thinking about entropy as a as a uh, as a shock indicator. So um, in the following, we're going to use entropy. I'll show how we can use entropy to flag the presence of shocks. And then when we know what is the shock, then we can compute this theta and then say, okay, here is a shock. Use a low order scheme. Here, oh, there is no shock here. Use a high order scheme, and then we can have higher uh, convergence. Um, we increase the possibility of having high, higher uh, convergence. So um, now the question is, uh, which entropy? Uh, we are using this the usual definition of an entropy. So this is the entropy that is related to the equation of state we're using. So it's just the physical logarithm of the pressure over the mass density. To the power of this adiabatic uh, index. And then the pressure, as I said, is given by the equation of state. So actually, the entropy will be dictated by the equation of states we're using. Okay, so we said that we have theta and we have the entropy. Now we have somehow to relate them. Okay, so the way, the most physical way to relate theta and uh, the entropy is through the second, uh, the second law of thermodynamics, which is just stating that entropy is not in a system 
is zero or increasing, it's never decreasing. And this is exactly what we wrote here. So this is here, the second law of thermodynamics. So one, uh, we see that we have the mass density, the entropy, and that's the, 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 the velocity of the fluid. So if one expands that and uses, massage it a little bit, uses the continuity equation and all this stuff, one can uh, uh, express this in, uh, as a function, time derivative of the, uh, of the entropy and the plus some coefficients and the, and, and the spatial derivative of the entropy. So um, uh, then uh, we can define in this way the so-called entropy production function. And then uh, we are going to use this quantity to relate theta with the entropy. Okay, so how we do that? So that, that's an answer. Okay, one could say that that's squared, but that is the simplest uh, answer that one can use. So uh, this is uh, the, the entropy production function that it's computed from the second law of thermodynamics. And uh, when uh, we have the formation of a shock, uh, of course, the, this will give a non-zero value, the second law of thermodynamics, and then N will have a non-zero value. And um, we see that, um, let's say that this, ah, we have maximum value also for the uh, entropy production function that it's one. So um, we do that in order to keep theta in between zero and one. But this is not, one could take other values also. So let's say that uh, N, ni takes the value one when we have a shock. Look what's happening down here. So these are the two neighboring points. So if it's a real shock and this have the value one and 0 0.8 or something. So this will be very close uh, to one and theta will be zero. So at this shock, n is one, theta is zero, and this is what exactly we wanted here. So theta is zero in the non-smooth region. And then it tells us, you know, uh, theta tells us, okay, uh, we get rid of the second term, uh, of the first term, and then we have only the low order scheme, which is stable on this shock. Um, so actually this answer is consistent with the requirements we had at the beginning when we uh, defined theta uh, in the flux limiter. Uh, so I'm done with the, uh, with the overview of the method. And now I'll show you how we can apply this method to different, uh, to some special relativistic tests, to GR tests, and then we'll see what happens when we have a binary system. Uh, so, so the first test is the so-called simple wave. Now uh, here we have the Euler's equations. You know we have uh, special relativity, so we have um, we are solving um, this equation here, but the homogeneous. So you know we have the full uh, thing, uh, but without GR. So we go progressively without GR, then we'll put GR, and then we'll have uh, the binary neutron star. Um, models. So here the simple wave, I chose that because it's just, one can say that this is um, uh, the special relativistic uh, uh, analog of the Burgers equations, of the Burgers equation I just saw. You remember that uh, we were starting from some uh, uh, initial smooth data and during the evolution we had a shock form. So this is exactly the same thing, but it's not a scalar equation. We're solving the full special relativistic uh, uh, conservation law that I just showed. And uh, so what I'm going to show here is that, uh, okay, we are choosing an equation of state and uh, we expect that uh, a shock will develop at around 0 0.63. So I just say that, so you could, um, maybe I'll move that a little bit. So I say that be because you can follow here the time. So on, up, on the upper frame, I have this, how the solution is looking during the evolution. And in the lower frame, we'll see how this entropy uh, production function is, uh, is behaving. So what one would expect is that it's zero, you know, when uh, we have the solution is smooth, and then it's peaking when the, um, um, the shock is forming. And let's see if that's the case. So everything is smooth, 
you see that the entropy, this knee is zero. So at around 0 0.63, you'll see that it starts picking. Can you see that here? So this means that you have, we have the shock forming up there and this is following the shock. So this means that, uh, let's play it once more. So now we're, theta is one and we are using the higher order scale. So we have fifth order convergence. Then when this starts picking in this region here, we start using more and more the low order scheme and less the higher order scheme. So here is a hybrid. So in this region, when this is picking, um, we're using the low order scheme, while in the rest that it's zero, we're still using the higher order scheme. So even when the shock is formed with this system, we're using the low order scheme only in the region where is the shock. In the rest, we're using the higher order scheme. So that gives um, a lot of hope that you know we can achieve high order accuracy. Um, okay, this is just to prove that this entropy flux limiter, as we say, EFL method is working fine. So we're locating the, the shocks. So let's see how accurate are these results. So here I have plot uh, the exact solution. So the exact solution is the red solid line at t equal 1.2. And the green uh, circles is our numerical results. We see that the, uh, you know it's uh, the accuracy is almost you know our um, numerical results is falling exactly on the exact solutions. So here I would just give an example of what can go wrong. So when we are not using the entropy flux limiter, uh, we see that you know these are the oscillations that are developing. While when we are using it, is this is what I just showed you. In the in the movie, uh, so it's really working, and this at least in this simple uh, case. So um, I, I'll conclude uh, the simple wave discussion uh, with a look at the convergence rate. So this is what we have achieved here. So and uh, this is we see that the convergence rates are between fourth and fifth order. This is what we expect. Fifth order is yeah too much, but fourth order is something that we can expect. And this is the best behaving uh, system that we are using um, in, um, in, uh, in Vienna. So I just put that as a comparison to see what are, uh, how our method compares to, to the existing results, to the best results. So we see that uh, we, uh, we are doing quite well. So we're on the same level, fourth and fifth order accuracy. A convergence rate. Um, now we have um, a little bit more difficult uh, um, uh, simulations here. So these are the so-called uh, Riemann problems. So uh, in the Riemann problems, we don't start from smooth initial data as before. We have a nice smooth bump and then we evolve that and then the shock develops. So we have a shock from the beginning. So we have this continuity at x equals zero. And then on the left-hand side, we have the values for the primitive variables that I'm showing there. And on the right-hand side, we have difference. So we have a jump, you know, from the left to the right, we have a jump. So we have already from the beginning, we have a shock. So uh, these simulations are quite <laughs> uh, difficult to solve. And uh, the first one, the SOT tube, it's quite mild, so the difference between the two sides is just from zero to one. While the blast wave one, we see that we're one order of magnitude more, so we have from zero to 10. And um, so what's happening when we are evolving this system? Um, so uh, we have this, um, you know, we have the, the initial discontinuity traveling. So uh, we have a shock here traveling to the right, and uh, that it's followed by a, con uh, a, a contact discontinuity. These are all going to the right. And then to the left, we have this rare function, uh, rare function wave. And uh, we see that um, uh, our results are uh, quite accurate. They are almost on top, you know, under these blue and red lines, uh, there is a solid black line, which is the exact solution. 
So um, we are uh, quite good if one considers that this is only 800 grid points. You know, if we increase the grid points we're using, uh, we have even better uh, accuracy. So, you know, our numerical results are even better fitting the exact solution. Um, yeah, this is what I wanted to say about the special relativistic tests. Now let's move to the 3D tests uh, with some uh, general relativity. So now um, I'm going to present two tests, 3D tests of uh, the so-called isolated neutron stars. So we have isolated neutron stars. The one is static, so nothing is happening. It's just static. Uh, and then the other one is stationary. So this means that this uniformly rotating. So uh, the first, the static um, uh, neutron star is called, uh, it's called TOV star. So it's a stable, yeah, so that's important that it's stable, it's isolated and static. So we have to use an equation of state to describe the matter of this neutron star. So we choose the gamma low equation of state and also um, the background space time, because here we have full 3G, uh, we have general relativity. So the background space time is not static. So we are uh, evolving dynamically the background space time. So it's, uh, it's quite challenging this, uh, this uh, numerical simulation because one could say, but it's just static, you know, come on, it's just sitting there. But this is problematic because as I said before, I have to make the connection between the shock that I described before with the scalar equations and the shock. One could say, where are the shocks? Where are the shocks uh, on a neutron star? So the shock, when we have a static neutron star, it's on the surface because you have matter inside, you have a finite matter uh, density inside, a finite number, and then outside of the surface is going to zero. So this, if one sees you know, the, 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 the plot of the rest mass density is just a very rapid decrease. So that's a shock. And this is very difficult uh, to numerically simulate, it's even with a static star, because you know all the error is uh, it's, it's piling up during the evolution. And uh, then it's changing uh, the accuracy that we can achieve when we're doing such kind of numerical simulations. So, so the first thing I'm I want to show as before, you know, this nice plot I show you that, you know, uh, during uh, when the simple wave is moving and then we see that the entropy production function is peaking when the shock is uh, um, produced. So I also sh um, use this two dimensional hybrid plot to show that. So here is the neutron star. The right hand side is the mass density. It's just the mass density, it's just the, 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 the density of the star. So we see that inside the density is quite high and then goes to zero really rapidly. The, the dashed line is the surface of the, of the star. And here on the left side, uh, we have this entropy production function. And one would expect that this has to pick to get high, val uh, high values on the surface. This is what it happens. It's not really, the resolution is not very good but we see that this is almost one. And we see that this is spread around the surface. So it's really interesting that, you know, the method it's putting the problematic, the problematic regions on this static neutron star. So outside it's zero, you see, this is zero and inside it's zero. So inside we are using inside and outside, we are using the higher order scheme. And on this slice, of the, um, of the surface, we're turning to the low order scheme because there is a problem. And um, so there are high chances that, you know, we have more accurate results in this way. So uh, the method, the entropy flux limiter method is doing exactly the same that was doing with the special relativistic uh, tests, you know, uh, pointing where is uh, the shocks in, uh, on our domain. Uh, so I'll just uh, briefly mention here are some uh, um, things that have to do with the accuracy of our um, simulations. So um, here on the on the right on the left side, um, 
um, what we have plot, uh, we are plotting uh, the, the maximum of the mass density. So the maximum of the mass density in the neutron star is in the middle. So that, that's the mass density. So the highest value of the mass density is in the middle. So during the evolution, we're tracking how the maximum is changing with time. So because it's a static, this, you know, the exact solution is that it remains the same. You know, it remains always the same. So what we'd expect here is that, you know, numerically we would like to have just a line. But numerically we can't do that even for a static model. If we have a long evolution, this is not possible. It depends, you know, there are systematic errors, there are numerical errors, there are a lot of stuff inside there. So you can't have zero. Of course, if you get very high resolution here, we have just 96 points. So when we increase resolution, this wiggles, they go smaller and smaller. This is what we expect. But what we see, it's exactly what one expects. So we have a wiggling around, uh, you know, the, the, the exact solution. And uh, our results are this blue line, while the other two are the ones that I'm using as a reference frames, the, the best results that uh, we have, um, you know, uh, obtained in, uh, in Vienna. And uh, this one here, it's also really interesting because uh, this is showing how good the method is tracking and resolving the surface of the star. So here I'm just plotting, that's the density, the, ma the matter density with uh, uh, distance. So here is the center of the star, at the center of the star. So we have the maximum value up here. And then we see that that's dropping, dropping, dropping. And then here at the surface, we have this really shock, uh, rapid drop in the mass density. And that is the shock that I'm talking about. So uh, this um, blue dotted lines, this is the exact solution. And this is what we have achieved. This is just with 96 grid points. So we increase uh, the resolution, we, we, we go to finer and finer resolution. This is going closer and closer to the, to, to the exact solution. So we see that the other two systems, after quite a long evolution of 1,000 solar masses, is this one? Yeah, uh, we see that they are losing it. So uh, you see that they are quite far out. Uh, they are assuming, you know, the, the matter has dispersed, you know, outside of the surface, the real surface of the star. Uh, and now I'm going to talk briefly about this. Um, the other experiment uh, with the uh, isolated neutron star. Now we have a stationary configuration. So that's a rotating neutron star. Um, so we have a stable, isolated, and uniformly rotating neutron star. Uh, we have the same equation of state, and you know, the background is also dynamically evolved. Here, the interesting thing that you know people are looking in the literature is uh, the velocity you know, of the neutron star. Because one expects that uh, the maximum velocity it's on the surface. And then when we go just outside, it drops to zero. That's even more, um, you know, um, rapid. This drop is even more rapid than the mass density that I just showed. And um, so here I'm just showing one of the components, the Y component along the X direction of the velocity of the rotating star. And we see that here is the surface. The dotted line is the exact solution. And the blue line is our results. We see that it's almost absolutely uh, uh, agreement. And that's only with 96 grid points. Yeah. 3D problem? 3D problem, yes. X, Y, Z, yeah, yeah. So it's the same thing in all the direction. I just got a slice. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, yeah, so, uh, yeah, after this one, so that was the last 1D, and now we're talking in 3D here with GR. Does that direction to be any direction? Not from the X, it's No, yeah, one, it's a frame. It's the Y, yeah. Yes, yes. Yes. Yep. So um, 
and uh, so we see that the other two systems uh you know it's not very well resolved it's actually not doing good job at all and uh, we see that uh this uh, efl system is doing really well and this is one of the best results that one can find in the literature so we have gone back uh to the existing literature uh and uh we looked at it and uh actually our results here this last reference has really nice results comparable to ours but the other two i think that we're really this is one of the best results in the literature for a rotating neutron star uh for these uh, velocity profiles one dimensional velocity profile. 96 points in each direction, 96 points in each direction. 96 cubes, yes 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 yeah but this is quite low resolution uh, it's not the lowest but it's okay so uh... good so i'm i'm now in the last part so i'm now going to talk about uh, binary neutron stars uh so um we close the chapter uh, the part where we have these isolated neutron stars tests, and now we have binary neutron star uh, simulations. So this is the first time that one can uh, that uh, one can use this entropy flux method to do binary neutron star simulations. Uh, previous work was stopping at the special relativistic tests, or maybe some of the POV, the isolated uh, static uh, cases. So, um, so here um, uh, I'm going just as I, I as I did before. I'm going to present that our method can track uh, the problematic regions, which is the surface of the stars. Now we have two stars, so we have two stars here. So all the configuration I'm going to show they are equal mass and no spin. And um, here one can read that you know uh, we are using the Loren. Uh, you know we have to prepare some initial data that we are evolving. So we use the Lorentz library to prepare this data, and uh, we are using a gamma low equation of state. Uh, this is a three-orbit uh, simulation. It's a quite short one, but for presentation reasons, it's really okay. So this is the total mass of the binary. That's the rest mass, the ADM mass. That's the angular. Yeah, you can read it up there. So um, and from left to right, what I have plot here, we have this hybrid plot. The left part is the entropy production function, and the right part is just the mass density, the rest mass density of the star. And this is during the in spiral. We got a picture during the in spiral. That's during the merger. We see that uh, the two stars are merging. And also, this is the after merger. So we see that uh, even up to merger, we see that you know the entropy flux limiter is really tracking. Uh, the surface and it's we haven't done anything by hand this is just we just put the entropy inside there and that's done automatically we are not putting anything by hand we are not changing numbers we just change the initial data and we say run that and it's so it's also simple because a lot of things are look nice but then they are so complicated and uh, people put so much effort and you know they put a lot of manpower to to adjust stuff and things like this that you know it's not affordable anymore for production runs and um so it's really interesting that even after even after the merger in the post-merger regime we see that the uh, efl method the entropy uh, flux limiter method can uh, uh track this outgoing density waves you know, you have the, 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 this merger and then, you know, these are outgoing and even then, um, you know, uh, we can track them. So here it's a little bit uh, nicer plot because we are using, you know, a different uh, equation of state. So we have a more realistic equation of state. Previous one was the gamma low. You see that, you know, the, the, the mass density, it's dropping exactly at the surface. It's a little bit more realistic. And uh, we see also the same thing that, uh, you know, um, have post-merger, in-spiral, merger, and post-merger regime. And we see that uh, our method is tracking the surface. 
I can show you an animated version of this thing. I think that's better. So uh, here we have uh, the whole uh, in spiral merger and post merger regime for uh, this specific configuration. Uh, yep. So uh, we're just, you have the two stars that are going left and right. You know, we have the viscosity and then they're getting closer and closer. And then here they're merging and you see this outgoing wave. And then this uh, uh, also the, uh, the spirals of the outgoing uh, uh, density, we can see them. You know, the entropy flux limiter can, 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 can detect them even after the mergers, you know, it's, 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 so we don't control anything there. You know, in the beginning we control, you know, the in spiral, but then when these two things are merging, we can't control anything. And even now you see, so that's the new neutron star. So that's in, uh, we, you have the two neutron stars, they merge, and then you have the new neutron star. And even in this new neutron star, we can see that the method can, uh, has identified uh, the, 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 the surface of the star. The matter outside the star here. Yeah. Is, is this your initial condition? Yes. So there's, not, there's no surface. There's no exact surface. It, no in the way that we have with the other equation of states. So this depends on the equation of states because uh, yeah, so we can't um, we can't control that. This is what we get. What we can control is how our method is responding to that. Yeah, this is what we did. If, you, if one uses a different equation of state, then one has more clear, but uh, this is more unrealistic. Because, you know, I think also with the sun, you have a little bit, you have the surface and then there is a halo around and, you know, it's not just zero, you know, you have a finite inside, a finite value for the mass density inside the surface and then it goes to zero. There is also something around. So I assume this is. So physically speaking, actually, excuse me, one moment. So the density drop in the sun is normal, since and more than the minus. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Well, that's exactly uh, the spirit of, of my comment here. If you take the sun, for example, which is the closest object that we can observe, we put the surface where we pass from the optically thin atmosphere to the optically thick interior. Okay. So this is where we put the surface. Obviously, this is a gaseous body, right? But we have to put a quantitative criterion, and this is the optical depth. Yeah. Okay. So in this case, what's a quantitative criterion, if any, that distinguishes the interior from the atmosphere or the halo, as you said? Yeah, um, I don't know. I we haven't created this initial data, so I have to look into the initial okay. data library. We're using the Lorentz library. I understand uh, this is the solution that you get with your equation, with the second equation of state. It's not such an abrupt surface as previously. It's more extended, slightly more extended to zones, and this is what you get. This is the solution to equation of state. It's less abrupt than previously. Yes, and, and, and you see that, you know, here, when you go from here, here you have five orders of magnitude. Yes, yeah. you, know, it's, uh, you know, it doesn't look blue exactly, but you know, it's also, you know, so I would say that the surface is here. Yeah, so the first, and this is what, uh, you know, the method is detecting. So, you know, it's just this first uh, rapid decrease. And, um, Okay, so I'm, uh, I want to show three more slides and uh, I'll conclude. So um, I assume that I convinced you that the EFL method is working really well in locating and tracking the, the surface of the stars. So which are the, the, the non-smooth regions in these problems. So now we can see how these waveforms are looking.
because you know some people um, that are doing gravitational wave uh, astronomy they said okay you do a really good job in tracking the surface doing all this stuff but show me your waves because this is what we get from the interferometers you know we get some uh, 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 waves and then we have to say okay let's see if our you know our numerical simulations can you know be used to to identify with the waves that we from the we take from the experiments so this is um for a longer um uh, simulation so here we have a 10 orbit with the same SLY equation of state and uh, so if you see that it's almost the same with the previous configurations just we put the two neutron stars a little bit farther apart so they can go around a little bit longer and um, here we see that this is the amplitude of the wave train so this is a typical wave train that we see in gravitational wave astronomy uh, it's really nice metric and uh, the, the, the amplitude is increasing and here it takes the maximum value so here is the merger and then uh, we have you know this remnant as I showed you before and then a new neutron, a neutron star is created here as we can see uh, so this is just for completeness that you know the waveforms we're getting they look reasonable and uh, also, the last thing I want to discuss, and this is how I advertise the whole talk, is that, uh, you know, the convergence, the waveform convergence with, uh, we get with this approach is higher by two orders than the uh, convergence we take with the state of, uh, state of the art simulations we have out there. So uh, here on the right hand side, it's one of the simulations. So how one reads these uh, graphs so here is just the difference the phase difference uh and the waveforms uh, between different resolutions so the red one is 64 with 96 the blue one 96 with 128 points and the green 128 with 160 points per uh, direction and um we see here that this difference is decreasing this is what we want so and how we judge if that's second or third order so uh if one sees here these small dotted lines this is the ideal convergence we would have compared to the highest resolution okay so how you read that when the blue solid line falls on the blue dotted line then we have exact second convergence when the 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 line the solid line is above the dotted we have uh, super convergence and when it's below, for example, here we have under convergence. So uh, here clearly we see that the existing simulations, they have a second order uh, convergence. And we see that this is um, this is exactly the same simulation, but with the entropy flux limiter. And we see that here we have a clear force of the convergence. And this is in the dominant two to mode. And uh, one could say, okay, can you check also what's happening with the other modes? And actually, this is really interesting that also in the subdominant modes, for example, I showed the 3, 2, and the 4, 4, we have clear fourth order convergence. These are by nature more uh, noisy, but uh, it's, it's clear that here before the merger, also I would like to say that this gray line here is the merger. So um, uh, that's the time. Yeah, that's its scale is retarded and uh, yeah. So um, so this green one here shows where is the uh, merger happens and we see that after the merger things are going a little bit uh, more wild and this is why also uh, it's increasing because you know we're getting closer and closer and things are not so clear anymore and that's something that you know that this um, wave differences uh, are becoming uh, larger and larger but the important thing is that this is decreasing with increasing resolution and uh, the same happens in all the modes that we have uh, studied so even in the higher order modes and these are the first time that what someone has achieved fourth order accuracy in such kind of uh, simulations 
So usually what we see is second order. So, uh, and also in the, uh, not only in the dominant mode, but also in the subdominant mode. And I think uh, I'm going to finish here a bit more than, yeah, thank you very much. It's time for relations. Uh, let me uh, clarify something. The, uh, the oscillations that you try to occur with your method, to occur with your method, are intrinsic of any flow. It's not uh, necessarily a relativistic flow or something. No, no. Uh, so uh, it is due to the Houdini scheme. Yes, yes. So the first one I just, uh, the first one I showed, it's just a scalar uh, equation. Yeah. So that's it's Burger's equation. There is no relativity. Okay, when you apply this uh, splitting method, then uh, you can split in any kind of fluid, right? Yes, of course. It's it's. Uh, and the second one. So also, then if there are uh, magnetic fields, etc., you can also. Yeah, yes, yes. Okay. I don't think uh, uh, this method uh, is interested only. It's looking where would you have this rapid drop in the mass or something, and then. I assume if you have magnetic fields, I don't know if it won't play any role in that. So I assume it, it, it has a wider applicability. Now, what I didn't mention that, that now we try uh, also to implement the method in more uh, in, in binary uh, neutron star simulations that are not equal mass and without spin. Uh, with that unequal mass and uh, we put some spin. So I think all this will come later on this more complicated uh, uh, apologies for going in and out. Yeah, yeah. I was trying to, uh, to get the discussion. Um, so, regarding this previous point that you made about where the surface of the object yeah. is to be placed, you mentioned correctly that you have the logger of density on the pair of your right hand back. Mm -hmm. So, we are talking about the decrease of uh, five order magnitude, uh, more or less intensity. This is a numerical criterion on where to put the surface of the object. What about the physical criteria? I mean, does this have to do with any anything physical in this case? So that you say, okay, this is the star, and this is its halo or atmosphere or whatever you like to call it. Do you have anything like that? You know, in the neutron star, um, I I really don't know about okay. uh, yeah. The neutron stars are not very you know uh, I don't know. They exist, but uh, I think they're a little bit out of our conceptual reach. You know, yeah, I don't know. They are exotic objects. Obviously. Yeah, so physically. That's one thing. And, yeah. and the second uh, question that I have in mind is uh, uh, Do you have any ideas or any guesses about what would happen if magnetic field was placed into the equation of the physical feature thereof? What would it be? And, uh, what kind of evolution and what change in the evolution would you expect? I think that uh, people are doing, I'm not sure, but I think that they are doing people that are doing uh, magneto hydrodynamics with right. binary neutron stars. I haven't looked at these things. So the group I'm working with, uh, we're developing a new code that it's going also, you know, the one that I just showed, we're using BAM that's developed in Vienna. And this code, I don't think one can include magnetoid, uh, magnetic uh, interactions there, but people are developing a new methods that can have, it's more global. And also we want to implement this and the reflux limiter there. So I assume that it's possible. And the only requirement for this method is that we can write, you know, the equations in this way, number one. So if you can write that, uh, we don't care what it's inside there. So we just approximate, we need just numerical flux and then we split the numerical flux and yeah, that's, that's a way to discretize an otherwise continuous yes. differential equation with partial yes. derivatives, which is well known. Yeah. That's one thing. The other thing is that if you 
I really don't know the answer, obviously, because I'm not doing that particular to that. But next is even in exotic situations such as neutral stars that help you delineate the physics in some sense. Uh, not only the definition of the surface, because you have to deal also with the change, major change in beta, mm -hmm. in the uh, uh, plasma beta parameter, and at the same time, give you an idea of the magnetosphere. Um, the astrosphere. Mm -hmm. But I think that again dictates part of the physics, particularly in cases where the magnetic field is dominant. Yeah, so I, I can't comment on that. I'm not, uh, my knowledge is not. Uh, one comment then. Uh, do we got us worried here with uh, this uh, scheme that are not accurate enough that show the surface of the static star? Then she sends out a lot of mass there. Yeah. So the solution is a blue line and get the others to keep all this mass outside in an atmosphere. Yeah. So you got to worry because when you see simulations of merging neutron stars, you see a lot of mass being ejected at the very early stages. They talk about the like, circle and stellar disk and jets and things like that. My telling us that most of it depending on the scheme, could be just America. When you have a scheme where you have a surface that the stars that emerge, they have touch, they yeah. start forming, you know, days. Uh, uh, yeah. How do you call this thing? Spiral. 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 days. Oh, ah, okay. And yet, you still have a surface. In the other simulation, you have a lot of that material. And we see things like the the, the Frankfurt simulations where the stars touch and immediately the whole screen is filled with, mat with material. And now you got the word how, how physical is that? It's just numerical because they don't have yeah. a scheme that treats correctly the abrupt stability. Yeah, I, I, I haven't seen the simulations. Maybe, you know, it depends on the configurations. Okay, this is just a single star. Okay, I'm not talking that we can get this kind of thing after the merger of two stars. It's a single star without any dark interface. Imagine now that it's merging with another one. All, all this material is going to be ejected and formed an atmosphere. And then, of course, it's what the, uh, Dr. Yerud said that there is the issue of magnetic fields. And everybody, when we see this in letter, we ask ourselves how much of that is just tidal, atmospheric, like this one, how much of it is magnetic. How was yeah. the role of magnetic field in injecting this material? And yeah, yeah. The simulations it, are impressive, but maybe some of it is purely numerical. Maybe, maybe, but also I have to see the, the configurations they're using because here we're using configurations that are equal mass, non spin, and then we end up to a neutron star. So there are cases that the, uh, the massive object that remains is black hole. So, yeah, 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 neutron star, but then when they merge, yeah, I don't know what's the remnant, what's after the merger. If you have a black hole, maybe what you say makes totally sense. Yes, 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 but about the other simulations that you mentioned, I mean, ah, okay, then my question is, why do you call such a Possible entropy. Why can't you just have a criteria of if my density gradient is greater than a certain threshold, then I switch to lower order? Nothing else. Just, just have. Yeah, yeah. Have uh, these schemes are doing that. Like this, just yeah, uh, uh, the, the, the two schemes, the red and the green ones, are doing that. And it doesn't. Yeah. Not no. Mm -hmm. And to answer Hugh's question, I'm not so sure this is going to be applicable to magnetic fields. What we're interested in very much in our center of magnetic fields is current shift. Current shifts mathematically, there are this continuity. The thing changes direction and they touch, and the field is the same cross, but it just changes direction. So there's nothing like this happening. There's no density change or okay. entropy change. It's just a mathematical discontinuity. We are very much interested in how to treat current shifts, but I don't think. It's not shock. Shock is a different. Yeah, so uh, change across the shock in a current 
Uh, so is, so yeah, much. so if, if the entropy, if there is no entropy increase, no, I don't think this method will work. Yeah. Just, yeah. Well, like you mentioned, it's an irreversible process, so entropy yes. is an appealing uh, parameter put in there, an appealing concept in that. But uh, there are there are more than one ways of involving entropy. Uh, you have put entropy in there, and if I remember well, then there's the ratio between the pressure and the density as well yeah. into there. Um, uh, that's your entropy definition. But uh, would there be any alternative definition that could be? Um, see, so what? So this you mean this was, one? No, I was. Uh, Thinking of the previous equation that we have in there, and which have the entropy. This one. No, uh, yes, right there. Okay. Uh, uh, this is. This is the entropy, uh, which is the uh, internal energy and yes. the ratio between the pressure and the density. Yes. Okay. Uh, this is uh, we haven't. Uh, this is the Valencia formulation. So this is how they formulated uh, the equations in order to bring them in this conservation form. So uh, this doesn't have to do at all with our method. Okay, I so, but uh, I think you are right about, you know, this is not unique, right, right. you know, because if one sees the original work, because, okay, we didn't think of that first using the entropy. Yeah, I didn't have time to say that. So actually this idea was initiated by the Frankfurt people so uh, it was uh, Quarcilena and um, Rezzola and um, uh, David Radice. So they had the first paper on that, but they couldn't go very far away uh, on, on this entropy flux limiter methods. Yes, yes, yes. So, so uh, 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 if I had, I could make a more throughout uh, discussion about that. Actually, uh, most of this, our method has been based on that, but uh, they had a lot of problems. You know, they, they, that was a breakthrough, but they couldn't do binary neutron stars. So they went up to this TOV static and, uh, you know, they had problems, for example, with these equations here. So they had problems with these equations here. They had some spurious oscillations here that depended on the, so, so the idea was there, but they had a lot of short back, uh, short, short, shortcomings. So, um, and also their idea wasn't the original one. That dates back 10, 15 years ago, where some people tried, um, you know, there is another method, you know, uh, to do what I just said here, you know, we're using the flux limiter in order to have this higher order scheme without oscillations. So people, mathematicians are doing another uh, approach is just to add some entropy, some viscosity terms into their equations. And in this way, you know, try to, um, to solve the problem. So this is how this idea started. So they had this additional vis uh, viscosity terms adding to the equation that they were produced from the entropy of the system. And then all this method developed to a flux limiter that went through these people in Frankfurt. So they got the, the idea that, you know, we could use the entropy, not as just computing, you know, adding these additional terms in the equations, but we could just uh, use it as a flux limiter. And no, 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 there is no viscosity terms. Yeah, 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 that, that's a big difference. We don't modify the equations. No, 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 no. And that was a big difference uh, with the, with, um, you know, with the original idea. So the entropy was uh, used to, 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 you, you, to obtain these viscous terms originally, but now it developed to different ideas. So entropy now is used as this uh, theta function to compute this theta function that is indicated when to use. The... So in essence, the whole thing is that it's an isolated system, no losses there, no viscosity. No, 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 yeah, yeah, that's good. Yeah. 
So, so we're not modifying the equations. Yeah, so actually what they did, they, they did the same thing uh, up here. So more or less, the, it's the same idea. Okay, that's quite standard, but uh, you know, they, they, uh, they, they thought that this theta must be motivated through entropy. Uh, so the idea was that the implementation is a different point, but you know, it's a very standard way. Of yes, 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 yes. yes. It's, yeah. good, it's just that the breakthrough is that you use this theta, you compute this theta based on the entropy on a physical uh, on on a physical quantity, and that's you know the big thing. And um, yes. No, 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 no. Uh, I just said that uh, we're using uh, different uh, schemes. You're approaching the, this, the higher order and the low order uh, in a different way. Also, when they compute theta, they're using some positive, uh, they're using some tools that we, are, we took them out. And because more of their problems, and that's their words, comes from that. So that uh, you know that the way they applied this really nice idea had some problems, but that's always the case. And the first time you try something, yeah. Um, but yeah, so we are kind of continuing. You know, we're based on their method, but uh, it's 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 kind of different. It's it's you know we have results for binary neutron stars and. Um, yeah. Okay. Any other questions from the audience here? If not, let me check what happens with the rest of the participants. Is there are any? Oh, there are seven. Uh, is there anybody back? I don't see any hand. You want one? Okay. So then Janis is asking, and then we. Okay, so 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 the, the so the, the 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 evolution is done with the BAM code that uh, that's developed by Bernd Bruckman, Sebastiano Bernucci, and a lot of other people in Vienna. And uh, so the computers we're using, we are using uh, clusters in Germany, around the world. Uh, yeah, wherever we can get some computing time, you know, we are using this computer. So this is all parallel. It's not unigrid. But the initial conditions are yours. No, 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 no. This is why I couldn't comment so much on the initial conditions. So uh, the initial conditions I mentioned that uh, these are from the Lorraine li library. Uh, so uh, these are publicly available. That's Bugim Bur Yeah. So it's his name is difficult. So that's in his group. Uh, but I said that we want to run a little bit more accurate uh, um, uh, simulations, and this is also in the initial data. So uh, the group in Vienna, collaboration with people that have been postdocs, PhDs in Vienna, they have uh, developed initial data. That are more accurate than that, and we are actually, you know, running simulations now with more accurate initial data that are eccentricity reduced and things like this, and uh, we expect that we'll get better um, results in the future. Have you compared with with actual? This is not my work. There are other people in the group that are doing that. So um, this BAM 97, this, uh, uh, I didn't, if you see the paper at the end of the paper, we have this faithfulness um, uh, uh, chapter, which is discussing exactly that. So exactly this one is quite accurate, this waveform, the BAM 97, and uh, we could use that for, you know, producing waveforms and for gravitational wave analysis. 
and uh, there are people working on that. So this specific group in Vienna that are doing that. And I assume during the year we'll, uh, we'll take out another paper that is, uh, you know, discussing especially this kind of... Yes, 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 yes. This is from, um, you know, yeah, not, that's a three orbit, that's a 10 orbit, but yeah. Yeah, these are the results we got. And also these ones are on the left-hand side, um, our results. Um, so yes. The initial condition is Lorenz library. Yeah. We are 10 orbits away from merger. Yeah, uh, so I'm, I don't know, there are some kilometers apart. So there are the, the, the neutron stars are some, I don't know, 15, 16, 30, I'm not quite sure, 30 kilometers apart. And then when you let that go, it takes 10 orbits, full orbits, and then they crash. And this is quite interesting because, you know, these three orbits here, it's three orbits, you know, it's not long evolution, but this 10 orbit, uh, this is really, you know, the code has to run quite, uh, and of course, you know, the infrastructure, the BAM is really awesome in that. So, you know, it was uh, doing really well. And um, yeah. Well, if there's no other question, what I see then, thanks again. And uh, we will be talking forward about the next one, the next seminars this week, and then we continue next week.